The scripture comes today from the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 2 and verse, verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. Uh, today we will be hearing from our new pastor. Um, his name is uh, Morgan, and the way I remember it, although I'm not endorsing any particular product, is Coke and Hour. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that's, that's my way of remembering his last name. And I hope that's okay, Coke and Hour. Not that he does that. Okay. It's more like uh, grape juice an hour. And uh, when you see him, you'll see that he's a young man. So he has lots of energy. And as was mentioned before, this is the, the new chapter of the York Church here, a new chapter, and uh, we, we hope the last chapter before translation. And so he has a, 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 a heavy task on his shoulders to, to transport us uh, into that uh, era. Uh, he was born and raised in South Carolina where he went on to attend the Southern Adventist University. While taking a year off to be, to be a missionary, he felt God calling him to ministry. When the Pastor Kokenauer came back from the mission field, it was then that he would meet his wife, Michelle. Michelle was born and raised in Pennsylvania, and I'm not sure if she has returned. Is she here? Could you stand so we can all see you, please? That's, and that's one of, one of the sons in the arm. There are two sons, uh, Jude and Thatcher. Uh, so when he came back from the mission field, he met his dear wife. And as you can see, he has been very uh, productive. Um, <laughs> she, his wife, attended the uh, BMA which is the, uh, the uh, academy here in uh, Pennsylvania. She went on to Southern Adventist University and then Wichita State University, where she graduated with a degree in speech language pathology and audiology. Michelle love, loves working with children and would love to do mission work in an orphanage. Pastor Kokenauer pastored in the Kansas, Nebraska, conference where he served as an associate, got his master's at Andrews University, serves as a senior pastor of West Lenox. Is that Lenox, Pastor? Lenexa, SDA, and All Nation SDA. His greatest blessings have come from his wife, Michelle, he says, his two sons, as we mentioned before, Jude and Thatcher, and witnessing someone accept Jesus into their hearts. He says, I see Jesus working in so many ways. I see him working through my wife and in her love for our family and others. I see Jesus working in my sons with the joy they bring to our family, and I see Jesus working every time I go to church and see the wonderful things God is doing in people around me. I believe Jesus is coming very soon. And he looks forward to the day when his family, friends, and people who are no longer strangers are gathered around the throne of God. He will speak to us right after the Willowdale Choir gives us the After the sermon? Oh. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I turned on here? <clears throat> How about now? You know, this happened to me last time. How about now? Happy Sabbath, everybody. I think this is going to be a tradition here at this church where I'm going to come up and switch mics. I'd hate to be the guy who has to follow that special music uh, because that was beautiful. And I echo all the uh, thoughts of Michael just what he said up here. Thank you so much. And you are welcome any, any time. You find yourself in this area, I don't care who's up here. You come up and say, I've got an open invitation, and we will stop and listen. I appreciate you offering that blessing. That was very beautiful. We are here in York, Pennsylvania. I've only vacationed here. Did you not know this was a vacation destination? It is a vacation destination for my wife and I and our family. Our mo- our one of my mother, wonderful uh, mother-in-law and her family are here, and it's just been such a great time getting settled in the past week. And I just want to thank you so much uh, for opening your arms and opening your church up. Uh, I can't believe you actually hired me, but I appreciate you opening your uh, arms up to me and my family so we can minister here. I do believe God has wonderful things. I spent a lot of time in prayer about this. And uh, I'm really, really looking forward uh, to finding out with you what God's going to do here. Uh, Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I praise God. I praise God that this world is not our home, that there is something better coming. Whether we sing it, whether we live it, whether we talk about it, God, I pray that we are always witnessing for Jesus not necessarily going up and saying his name, but acting like him, loving like him, accepting like him, because that's your church. Father in heaven, I pray for your word today, that your word would not fall on deaf ears, that your word would go straight to all of our hearts and would convict all of our hearts and would draw all of us closer to Jesus Christ. I pray all of these things Oh, in the most holy, the most precious, the most beautiful name, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Forty years in the wilderness. Forty years in the wilderness. Because ten guys, oh, twelve went in, but ten guys come back and said it's not possible. There's going to be times when people on church board and in churches and in families are going to come to you and say, it is not possible. But when God has already ordained victory and already promised the land, it doesn't matter what everything looks like. All things are possible. And I want us to know that right now, that all things are possible because victory has already been sealed on the cross. And our Lord reigns on the throne. So anytime we get on our knees and we don't know how we're going to do this, how we're going to pay for this, how we're going to accomplish this, don't say it's not possible because 10 guys already did and it cost Israel 40 years in the wilderness. Can you imagine how Adam and Eve felt raising kids still being able to look at the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine raising your kids and telling your kids that I was one of the guys who didn't think we could go up and take this promised land? And having to wait until every man over 20 had to die before Israel could go into the promised land. 
I was at BWI Airport. I was coming through, walking through the terminal. And off of this one plane were all the World War II vets. And they were coming out in wheelchairs. They were coming out in walkers and canes. And they had these hats on, they had these shirts. And they had this team that would go before them. And they'd tell everybody waiting to get on the plane, hey, these, World War II, these are World War II vets. When they come off, let's cheer. So they're going down into the terminal, and they're giving everybody an American flag. So that when these guys walk off, you know what they're doing? They're clapping. They're cheering because these are the last remaining ones alive who maybe stormed the beaches of Normandy and survived. So we remember and we promote these. But don't you know you knew who was going to be the last ones alive who didn't go into the promised land? Maybe you walk by their tent and you know that guy, we're waiting on him. He is the last one. One that has to go before we can go into the promised land? Do you think maybe a, a kind dear old woman made a special manna loaf for this guy to eat so we can go ahead and get this over with so we can go into the promised land? Would you want to be the last guy that everybody looks at knowing everybody's waiting on you before we can get this show on the road and go take the promised land? I want you to turn your Bibles with me to the very last chapter of Deuteronomy. The very last chapter of Deuteronomy. Because the Bible tells us who the last guy is. Everybody knows who the last guy is. Open your Bibles with me to the last chapter of Deuteronomy. Moses would stand up in front of all of Israel with the plains of Jericho behind him. He has the Jordan right behind him, and then just beyond the Jordan is Jericho. Now, there's some hills there, so you may not have been able to see it. I like to think you could see it. So you're looking at Jericho, you're looking at the Jordan, then you're looking at, I'm sorry, you're looking at Moses, looking at the Jordan, then you're looking at Jericho. Moses gets done preaching the book of Deuteronomy to the people of Israel. This is Deuteronomy chapter 34, and when he is done, Moses goes up on top of the mountain. The last time Moses went up on top of the mountain, he got to see, or he got to get the Ten Commandments and the law, but he also got to see the glory of God. This time he goes up on the mountain, God shows him all the land, furthest north, the furthest south, and out to the sea. He shows him everything. We're talking about at least 400 miles in some directions. Hundreds and hundreds of miles. It's a miracle what just took place here. But he sees all the land that God is going to give Israel, his people. Now, I want you to pay attention to this very short verse here. Verse 5, chapter 34, verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him. That's all the Bible says. He buried Moses. I did a funeral a while back. The husband was in the hospital bed, and he was in and out of consciousness. The last time he came out of consciousness, his wife was sitting there next to him on the bed. He opens his eyes, and he reaches out for his wife. And she reaches out for him, and they embrace, and they have one last kiss. And he slipped out. Can you imagine the last moment that God has with Moses? Maybe there's a, an embrace, a hug. Saying, maybe God turns to Moses and says, Moses, it's time. Come here. And he gives him a hug. And then Moses goes limp. And then God just lays him down. And he buries him. And Moses doesn't come down the mountain. This was devastating for the people of Israel because they'd followed Moses so long. But brothers and sisters, it's not about the man down here. It's about the God up there. And God raises up and he grooms people for positions and places to always carry the work forward. You're going to get another, I hope you do not get another pastor before Jesus comes. But if Jesus doesn't come, you're going to get another one. And maybe another one. And maybe another one after that. But it's not about who stands here. It's about who lives and breathes and sits on the throne up there. And that's who we always need to have our eyes fixed on. Yes, Joshua, Joshua a very capable, and we will see an amazing leader for the children of Israel. But brothers and sisters, we don't look at the man. We look at the God. 
and we follow our God and we stand in the ranks and we move forward and we move forward and Joshua takes the baton and now it's time to go get Jericho. Now what gets me about this is they send two spies in. If they hadn't learned anything, what happened the last time they sent spies in? They didn't take the promised land. So you know what? We're going to send more spies in this time. Except they only send two. And I wonder if the reason they did that is because only two guys came back and said we could take it. We're not going to send 12 this time. We're only going to send two to, to maybe improve our odds that we'll get a, a favorable report. So two guys go in. And when they go in, the king sends out his men because he finds out that two people from Israel have come into the land. So he sends his guys out searching for them, and he finds them. He does find them until somebody lies about it. They get into Rahab's house. Now, do you know where Rahab lives? Do we have the pictures? Please do. Rahab lives on the wall. And I want you to turn, your, turn with me in your Bibles to, to Joshua chapter 2, verse 15. Joshua chapter 2, verse 15 says, Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall so that she was living on the wall. The Bible, in one verse, says that she's living on the wall twice. We're not waste. The Bible never wastes words. There's no fluff in here. Everything that's said, you probably should read. And anytime it repeats itself, it's not being redundant or wasteful. They want you to know she lives on the wall. This is what the walls of Jericho look like. So on these walls, you come to the front part. If you can make it over that outer part you still got to go up a slight incline to get to the other wall. If you make it over that first wall, you are dead meat and easy pickings for anybody who wants a piece of you. Because you still got another wall to climb up. I want you to go to the next picture. That's not it. Okay, here's the wall right here. So I'm not talking about the walls of, of China here, where a house is on that. These walls, the outer part, basically you call them the slums. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. The sermon today is called best view in the city. How could you sell a house to somebody on this wall? Now, we're looking for a house right now, and it's, it's really kind of sometimes comical to read the descriptions of these homes. A realtor could take a home in the middle of a landfill and say, listen, you'll never have to pay for trash removal. <laughs> How would you like to have 20 bucks off a month if that for not having to throw out your... <laughs> just throw it out your backyard. I mean, listen... How do you sell this home? And listen, I just want to show you this one house. It is a beautiful home. It is the best view in the city. You're going to see everything. You're going to look out over the plains. Some of the most expensive homes are on top of the mountains when they look out over the whole city. Oh, you'll see the whole city. And you'll see the whole enemy as they approach. In that house, maybe she's eating lunch, and she looks out the window, and she sees Israel crossing the Jordan. And then she remembers. Forty years ago, this is what this guy did. Then all of a sudden, the Lord parts the Jordan, and this is what he did right here. Oh, my goodness. This God's got to be something amazing. So these guys come in to the harlot's house, and she hides them. A harlot hides the people of God. And all she asks in return, save me. Save me. Save my family. Now, I want you to read this real quick with me. Verse 14 of chapter 2. So the men said to her, Our life for yours, if you do not tell this business of ours, and it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land, that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Now, verse 17. Then the men said to her, We shall be free from this oath to you, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down, and gather to yourself into the house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. It shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be free. Now, we have the benefit of hindsight in all of this. But what they're asking them to do is, everybody, if you want to be safe, you have got to stay in your house. You know what God tells Joshua in chapter 6? You're going to march around the city and all the walls are coming down. You do not want to be on the wall. So the last place Rahab needs to be for her survival is in her house. 
because her house is on the wall. And if I challenge you, please, because I've read through this, God does not tell anybody how he's going to take this city until chapter 6. So these guys are saying this without knowing that God's going to bring the walls down. Hey, hey, Beverly, Beverly, I know you're taking this trip on the Titanic, but if anything happens, you don't come out of your cabin. You lock the door. You grab your suitcase. You do not come out. No matter what happens, Beverly, don't come out of your room on the Titanic. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe John didn't know that the boat was going to sink. So these guys come out, all the fighting men, and start marching around this city. Now, I need some help here. I need some kids. How many kids we got in the congregation? This is going to be another little mini children's story. I need all the kids to come up real quick. All the kids, come on up. All the kids, please come up. We're going to do a little bit of an experiment slash uh, demonstration. I am not responsible for anything that happens to this building as a result of this demonstration. Mike is. So I need you guys to come on up front. I need you to stand up. Because this is really all you have to do, okay? This is all you have to do. Just stand right here in a line. Just stand in a single file line. Stand right in front of this pew. Just stand right in front of this pew. Okay. Now, this is really all you guys have to do. Do you guys like yelling? Oh, uh, no. Oh, we don't, you don't, you're not a yeller? God bless you. Where are your parents? Oh, my word. That is beautiful. Okay. So, I need you guys to kind of wrap around and form a circle. Okay, just wrap around and start forming circles. So you need to come around here and stand next to this guy. There we go. You're doing great. You are doing great. Okay, this is what we're going to do. On the count of three, I want you to yell as loud as you can. Then I want you to cover your heads because the walls are going to come down, okay? Okay? If you need to come, uh, this man's smart right here. He's got his ears plugged up. Okay, you can plug your ears, <laughs> but, on the count, but you need to be able to hear me count to three, okay? Okay, so, but when I count to three, well, this guy... You see this look on this man's face? He is ready to, oh, man, this is going to be awesome. Okay, so when I count to three, you yell as loud as you can. All right, you ready? One, two, three. Okay, hey, do you hear anything? Okay, that didn't work. Okay, well, no, it's simple because it says it right there. If we do this, it's, it's going to happen. The walls are going to fall down. You ready? Do it one more time. You ready? One, two, three. All right, stop. Let me try something. Hold on a second. You stay right here. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Okay. Hold on a second. Are you ready? Let's try this right here. We're going to get this piece of paper to fall over. We came up here and we were yelling. Something's falling over. Okay? You ready? Right there. Hold on. Okay, you ready? On the count of three, we're going to yell, and this piece of paper is going to fall over. You ready? One, two, three. <laughs> One more time. One, two, three. Somebody blow on it. Just blow on it. Just blow on it. Okay. You guys can go back to your seats now. You guys can go back to your seats. You guys go back to your seats. God tells Joshua and the children of Israel to walk around a city, and on the seventh day, walk around it seven times, and at the end of the seventh day, after you get done walking around that last time, you yell and shout as loud as you can after you hear the trumpet sound, and the walls are going to come down. You don't need two spies to do this. You do not need two spies to go into the city when all you're going to do is walk around the city and the the walls are going to fall down. Why are these two spies sent in? Because Rahab's there. And God wants Rahab. See, these people come in there. You know what Rahab says to these two guys? She witnesses to them about how amazing their God is. I've heard about your God. Your God's amazing. He is amazing. And I know what he's going to do. I just want you to save my family. Okay, well, then what you need to do is you need to invite everybody into your house. I don't care if your room's on the Titanic. God will save that room. I don't care what's going on or where you are. As long as God's called you to be there, it doesn't matter what happens around you, God's going to deliver you. And God delivered Rahab. And everybody, can you imagine that conversation when she runs up to her dad and says, Dad, you need to come to my house? Because 
This is the only safe place in the city is a harlot's home? When she runs to her brothers and she runs to her sisters and tells them, you've got to come to my house because the only safe place in the entire city is my house. Who is going to believe that mess? Did she go to anybody? Did she go to a cousin? Did she go to anybody else in the city? Or maybe she didn't because she didn't want the cover to be blown. But if the only safe place in the city is your house, who are you inviting over? I don't care what your reputation is. Who are you inviting over? I don't care what their reputation is. Are you going over? I don't care what you think about this person or what kind of interaction you've had in the past. Are you going over? Because the only safe place in the city is her house. They yell, and those walls come down. And the only safe place in the city. Maybe they got antsy. And maybe you've had this situation before in your lives where you feel like God's called you to do this, and all of a sudden things start happening. Maybe you're not so sure that God's called you to do this. Was I wrong? I mean, there's times, I mean, God called Paul to go into these cities, and he'd get beat. But he never doubted that he was called to go in that city. Oh, maybe God wasn't calling me in there because of how that turned out. There's going to be times when you question when things look like they're falling down all around you. I want you to look in chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1 of Joshua. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went in and no one went out. All of Jericho put their faith, put their hope, put their whatever in the walls and the strength of Jericho. They tied it all up. And by all circumstances, looking at this, you'd think they were at the advantage because these walls are impenetrable. But in the famous words of Bugs Bunny, on the contrary, I've got you. You look out here, I don't have a wall. I don't have anything. You look like the one who's got all the upper hand, all the power, all the advantage. But brothers and sisters, I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 46. Psalm 46, I should say. Psalm 46 had a professor who said, you never call psalms chapters. So it's kind of stuck with me. Psalm 46, verse 1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. The earth should change. And the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. We shall not fear, because Jesus is our refuge. Jesus is our strength. We come to him, and brothers and sisters, the world is going to fall around us. There's going to be times when we are shaken. Oh, we're going to be shaken. And I pray that when we're shaken, we're shaken to our knees. And we come to Jesus. We come to our strength. We come to our refuge. That we come to him. Brothers and sisters, it is so important that we read our Bibles. No, we're not talking about a checklist you do every day. To read our Bibles and become familiar. To know the word of God in our lives. To know the promises. To know that no matter how things look in the world right now, God is in control. And we have been given an incredible commission that this is the only safe place in the city. Not this roof. Our God is the only safe place. And he's going to come. And we're going to shout. Brothers and sisters, we need to cross that Jordan River. We need to have a moment in our own personal lives when we cross and we leave this old world behind. Sometimes we're in the middle of the river and we're looking at this bank and we're saying, man, that looks so fantastic. And we look at this bank and say, oh, that looks so fantastic. I'm just going to stay here in the river. Just going to stay right here so I can have the best of both. I want the best because this other one is sinking sand. Sinking sand. Have you told your wife recently about Jesus Christ in your life? Have you told your husband about Jesus Christ in your life? When was the last time you told your children how much you love Jesus? Ah, oh, I've got to tell you, Jude. 
I love Jesus so much. My son knows I love sports, but I want him to know that I love Jesus. I want him to see me spending time with Jesus. I want him to see me on my knees in prayer to Jesus. That's something I want my child to see, that he never has to doubt. Man, if anything, he likes to spend time with Jesus. There's going to be things that are going to happen in the family, but I want my family, and I want my wife to know that I love Jesus. I want my dad and I want my mom to know that I love Jesus. I want family members to know that I love Jesus. And we all have family members that we want to be safe in the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming. Oh, he is coming so soon. No words that anybody says on the face of this earth will be able to convey the magnitude and importance That's why it's not my words. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts each one of us of that. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit convicts each one of us of how soon he's coming. I don't know what God's calling us in our church to do, but he is calling us to go out and take York. He wants us to march on this city. Not going around beating our chests and beating the drum about how you need to be saved. You need to... No, uh uh-uh. When you share Jesus, you may not even have to say his name, but you just share his love. You see, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Because that's how you're going to know. That's how all these people are going to know that we're God's disciples. It's not what aisle we stand on, not where we live, not how much money we make. Oh, the devil's got a whole slew of ways to divide us. Christ unites. That's why we fix our eyes on Jesus. And we allow him to lead. Now, the reason this is fitting for us today is, yes, I'm the new pastor here, and I need your prayers. I need your prayers. Because I don't know what tomorrow holds. None of us do. But Jesus is in control. And I want you to turn back to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. And I believe these words, in this context, we're talking about the promised land. Our promised land is heaven. Our promised land is heaven. That has been promised to each person who gives their lives to Jesus Christ. I don't care if you're a harlot. I don't care if you're in jail. You give your life to Jesus, regardless of what someone else in a pew may be thinking. This has been promised to you. Heaven has been promised to you. Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 6. If you haven't read this before, or it's been a while, be strong and courageous, God's saying this to Joshua, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you, to do all that the Bible, that God's word has commanded, has given, has directed in us in our lives. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law, this Bible, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. We claim this Bible. We read this Bible. We allow this Bible, the Word of God, to come into our lives and guide and direct every aspect of our lives. Every aspect of our lives of our lives. And that way, when our head hits the pillow at night, we can rest in peace knowing that we have done what God has called us to do and we have not done anything under the table to be ashamed of. Because we are followers of Jesus and we are held to a higher standard. We are kings, we are princes and princesses in the kingdom of God. And we're going to go home. Harlots, murderers, you name it. We claim Jesus, we're going to go home. And as we start this new journey, my prayer for this church is that we're strong. We are strong. When those Boston Marathon, when those bombings hit, mm, when that tragedy struck, I was listening to a sports talk radio the next day, 
and he was commenting, the Boston Bruins couldn't play hockey. They closed down all the sports. Their next game, that guy gets up to sing the national anthem. Mm. How important those words are at a time like this in America. He maybe gets five words before he is drowned out by the sound of every person who's come to watch that game. I have never heard a stadium (laughs) drown out the performer. I've I've heard people hum and, and sing to themselves, but out loud in unison to a T, everybody sang and trumpeted the national anthem. And the commentator said, sports unites. Are we at a place in our lives or in this world where you go to a sporting event and everybody stands up in unison, cheers in unison, and boos in unison? Is sports the great uniter in our world today? Sports unites, Jesus divides. There's a time coming. And it may already be here. in which we're going to be divided along every imaginable line. And we're going to come to church, and we're not going to look at somebody because they're the child of God. We're going to look at somebody because of what they believe, because of their choices, what they've done, how they voted, where they put their money, where they don't put their money. We're Christians. And we have given our lives to Jesus. And because of that, we are one in Christ. And my prayer is that we're strong. That when anything hits, we unite in prayer. We unite in the word. And my prayer is that there's a protective hedge placed around this church around each one of our homes that the Lord stands and defends each one of our marriages each one of our families so that when people come and talk to us they'll say I know your God I've seen what he's done in your life I've seen what he's done in your church I want to be a part of that I want to invite you to stand as we have closing prayer God Almighty, God Almighty, who with mere words created the heavens and the earth, with his mere breath put life into our nostrils, God Almighty, who reigns, who reigns over the whole universe, created it all, God, I pray, I pray for your hand to be upon this church. God, I pray for your hand to be upon each church that's represented here today, that your Holy Spirit would be poured out in a Pentecostal-type way, Lord, that you would pour it out upon our hearts because, Lord, the time is short and we want to cross the Jordan. We want the promised land. It is there for the taking. Heaven is there for the taking when we accept Jesus Christ. God, you have given us a great commission to go and invite people into the only safe place in this world, and that's Jesus. God, I pray that we're strong because there's going to be times when we're going to be beaten down, and we're going to feel so weak. But I pray that it's in those moments, in every moment of strength and weakness, that we look to Jesus Christ, that we run to Jesus Christ, that we pray to Jesus Christ, that we claim the word of Jesus Christ. God, I know you're coming so soon, Lord, and I praise your name for the the moments of conviction. And God, I pray for that conviction to be a lifelong one on this earth, 
for each one of us in this church. God, I pray for your hand to be upon each marriage in this church. My prayer, my prayer is for our church to be an example of happy marriages. That we would not be a statistic, but that we would be a leader and an example on how to ask forgiveness from a spouse and how to grant forgiveness to a spouse and not bring it up later down the road. On how to encourage our spouses and defend our spouses and love and respect our spouses. And that people would see that and want to know why we have such happy marriages. God, I pray that our marriages glorify Jesus. God, I pray for our children. Oh, my God, I pray for our children. The children that are sitting in the pews and the children that are sitting somewhere else. For family members that are sitting in the pews and for family members that are sitting somewhere else. God, you love them so much. And you loved Rahab so much. God, you sent two spies in there to get her. There are people, there are family members in this church that you want us to go get. God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to lead and guide in ways to help us bring those people back to Jesus. And I pray for those people who aren't family members, but who are your sons and daughters that you want us to go get. It's not time for us to wait around and wait for them to come to us. We go get them. Go get them. And I pray that you would lead this church, lead our families in ways to make that happen and bring them in. God, I pray for our families. And Lord, I pray that the angels that stood guard around the Garden of Eden would stand guard at the doors of our homes, would stand guard at the television remote, would stand guard at the computer, would stand guard at the radio, would stand guard at every avenue the devil tries to use to split our families apart. And that the flaming swords would be waved in defense saying, no, 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 not this house. This is my house. That's my blood. Those are my children. Defend. Lord, you are our God, and we are your people. And I pray that you be our God. Be our God. God, please be with us now. And Lord, I don't know what the future holds for this church or for the churches that are represented here. But God, I pray that we fix our eyes on Jesus because Lord, it's only going to get worse. And when worse comes, God, I pray for your grace and your spirit to move powerfully and that we rise up. We rise up as the church we are. We rise up as the body of Christ that we are. And we march on the cities, claiming the souls for Jesus. To God be the glory. Amen.